Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, please. Acts chapter 6, if you're not there already. I'm sorry it's taken us this long to get from Acts 5 to Acts 6. Of course, we had the New Year's activities come between us. And I appreciate Joel filling in for me last week. Um, I had to go to South Carolina for a funeral, but here we are. Um, you know, <clears throat> in our day, it's, it's kind of hard to look back 2,000 years. Admittedly, we don't know um, what all the earliest uh, church looked like, and in this case, we have literally the earliest church, not just 100 years later, but, you know, right there in the very beginning, and there's a lot we don't know what it looked like. We don't necessarily know how they did everything, you know, the specific ways. But we do know um, that there are things that they did, uh, Scripture tells us. And just because we don't know everything exactly doesn't mean we can't know anything. For example, there are things that we do know. Uh, we do know that uh, there were um, thousands of people, you know, at this point in this early church. We know that God the Holy Spirit was moving among them and doing wondrous things. We do know that they must have had some planned, um, you know, get together. Some, you know, we'll meet here next Lord's Day. Um, and, and in this case, uh, we know that when they did gather together, they were somehow able to identify these seven men um, and discern who they were and if they could fulfill what the apostles were looking for. And just because we don't know all the details doesn't mean that there aren't things we can know. Nor does it mean that in our day, because, you know, we don't know specifics, doesn't mean that we can just do everything willy-nilly either. You know, we, we do want to follow as best we can what we do know. So when somebody says something to me like, well, we don't know what the first church was like, and therefore just kind of do whatever you want, I'm like, well, slow down. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't do that because it maybe violates other principles and information we do know. So look with me, if you would, at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Luke, God through the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit through Luke, tells us, Now in those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples. And so far, we've been able to see that there's probably over 10,000 people here. And he, Luke's, Luke just said the full number. Okay, so we were talking thousands of people. And they said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. Hold on to that thought. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Prominus and Nicholas, a proselyte, of Antioch, if I didn't pronounce those words right, because I don't speak Greek. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So we want to look at this text and discern what we can from it this morning. Let's ask God to help us do that. 
Father, we do come before you again in Jesus' name. And as we just said, Lord, we, we need you. Uh, we need help. Um, we thank you for your word. We thank you for yourself, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who causes us to understand, brings things like this back to our remembrance, and enables us to not just know, but to do for you. And so, Lord, we just ask that you help us do that this morning, that you have your will and your way, and that you bring honor and glory to yourself, cause your word to be powerful, and move in the hearts of your people with it, please. I ask that you do this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, as Christians, we are concerned, at least I hope we are, and many of us are, concerned about the truth um, of what we, what we believe and, and, and the way we do. And, and what I mean by that, now we don't want to just know truth. Um, we want to know it perfectly. You know, so when it comes down to theology, we want to know black and white. It's this, not that. Do it this way, not that way, right? I mean, I think like that. I hope you think like that because, you know, t tampering with God's word, serious business. Um, you know, if he, gives, if he gives instructions, you know, whether it's to disciple people or to build swing sets, you, you know, we need to do it his way, right? So I want to know exactly what bolt to use and what, what nut to turn, where it goes. I want to know it all. I want to know it right. So when I put this thing together, it's correct. I wasn't raised in church. I don't think in, in, in terms of denomination. I've told you that before. So I don't, you know, come to the table with, with something to prove or disprove or whatever. I, I, I try to be very objective, and I, and I hope Christianity itself really does do that. Because when something's not right or we don't think that it is, you know, we, we, at least we, some of us do want to fix it, right? You know, if, if you were to go to a, a church or to a ministry or something and, 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 and they had a, a practice that maybe you weren't accustomed to, you, know, you want to evaluate, is what they're doing right? Is what I practiced before right? You know, which one's right? Let's do the right thing, right? In our families, in our businesses, whatever the case might be. What we don't do, what, what we shouldn't do, is run from it. And, and I say it that way because oftentimes that's exactly what we do. When, when we see something that isn't working biblically, or at least what we think is biblical, Instead of putting forth the effort to fix it or fix us. Well, I mean, I passed four churches on the way to get here. So I'll just go to one of them. And if you've been in the church any time at all, you know people who have done that. Well, the first century church couldn't do that. There wasn't a second Baptist church in Jerusalem. <laughs> Right? There was the church at Jerusalem. And that's where the Christians got together. And as you follow that path throughout the New Testament, I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, we, in, in the New Testament is largely written to fix problems. Right? So, so as you read Ephesians, Corinthians, Galatians, James, you know, those writers are saying, hey, uh, control your tongue. Don't uh, don't rob your neighbor. Don't don't take them to court. Take Lord's Supper this way. You know, it's 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 a problem fixing book. So here we have before us a precedent for fixing problems that really kind of sets the stage for much of the rest of the New Testament to fix problems. But what you don't see. Is people say, well, I'm going to go to Second Baptist Church because I like their music program better or whatever. I'm not saying there's not times to leave. I'm just saying that, you know, 
there's a lot less times to leave than there are to stay. The fact is, and you know this, there's no such thing as a perfect local church. We've often heard somebody say, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because it won't be perfect anymore. Or, Let me know because I'd like to go or whatever, right? We've heard that. There's some truth to that. We've noted earlier in Acts that things were really going good. And, we, and I tried to prepare you for this. I was dropping some seed thoughts because I knew when we got to Acts 6, bam. Here we go, right? Well, here we are. So here we go. In Acts 6, 1 through 7, we find a problem. But we find a solution to the problem. And then in the last verse, verse 7, we see God's blessing upon the solution to the problem. In fact... If you were to highlight in your Bible, in verse 1, where Luke says, the disciples were increasing in number, then you have this problem, you have this solution, have the selection of these, what we call deacons now. Then in verse 7, he says kind of the same thing. The Lord blessed their solution, and the church grew, even to the point of many of the religious leaders becoming Christians. So God seems to have blessed what's going on here. There's a second issue at hand here, and this deals with church polity. So we're going to approach this text a little bit different than we typically approach a text. Acts is going to force us to do this in other places too. When we get to Acts chapter 7 and chapter 8, there, there's these long messages and uh, it, it, it's kind of hard to preach 27 verses or whatever of a, of a sermon and without taking six hours to do it. Now, if you want to get together for six hours, we'll have lunch that day and do three and three, whatever. But probably we don't want to do that. Acts, it has a lot of that. It's coming up soon and then towards the end of the book as well. So we're, we're going to take it a little bit differently than, say, we may a uh, Galatians or a 1 Corinthians or whatever the case might be. So this is going to be a little bit different. So, but we're going to look at the, the two issues, the problem and then the polity. In the first section here, or the first part of the message, we, we do find the problem, okay? The problem is, is given to us, and, and the way Luke describes it is it's neglect, so he tells, um, the, the, remember this is written to Theopolis, so he's informing Theopolis of, of Luke, the book of Luke. Um, he's saying, as the church grew, we started having some problems. And one of the problems at hand was the neglect of these widows in the daily distribution. So that's the problem, but in his text he tells us that this, Division seemed to be among people groups, or at least language groups, okay? So you have Jews, but you have Hebrew-speaking Jews. Then you have Hellenists, which are Greek-speaking Jews. Now, he doesn't elaborate to us this problem. But he, he does tell us that it had to do with widows, so probably there was a poverty issue at hand here because these widows probably didn't have somebody to provide for them and the church was doing it. That's what, one of the reasons why we saw the selling going on before previous chapters. But whoever was doing the distribution, and we don't know that either, it looks like, and I, I want to be careful here, but it looks like some prejudice rose up. And, and, and there was an, an, an inequality or a, a neglect among these people. Now again, we don't know everything. And, and, and it could be that they were just prejudiced. Whoever was doing the distribution was prejudiced. Well, I don't even like those Hellenists. They should speak Hebrew, amen. You know, hey, if you're going to come here, speak English or whatever. Maybe that's the mentality, right? Could be 
uh, that, you know, they just didn't like them. I don't even like them. Their culture's different. They, they, they eat weird food. Ah, weirdos. Sometimes we kind of can do that, can't we? I can't believe people eat with their fork upside down. What is wrong with them? You're in America, man. Turn that thing up. Maybe there were other cultural issues. Now, let's be honest about it. As I tried to just get across what may have been some of the problems here, can't we self-identify with some of those kind of thoughts? Don't we sometimes look at other people and think, what's wrong with them? Well, this is how they should be doing it or whatever. This is one of the reasons why I encourage you kind of regularly. And as COVID moves on, hopefully we can do it more. Take a missions trip. Go somewhere where using the bathroom is work. Out in the boonies. And some of you have been there. Togo, Ghana, West Africa, China. I know. And, and, and all of a sudden, you start to resonate with these people a little bit. Man, I, I took a lot of things for granted. You start to think about them a little bit differently. You start to get some insights, Westerner, about them. And that's a good thing. Because they are God's people too. Amen? Even if they do things a little bit differently. So we don't know why this neglect happened, but we do know that there was neglect. We see it maybe not on such extreme levels, but you also see differences in our local church among people that are maybe all from Michigan or whatever the case might be. You see distinctions even among us sometimes. And, you know, we think it should be done this way or it should be that done that way or, or whatever the case might be. And again, this is why we say, let's go back to the Bible. But don't run. So then we see the problem. And then Luke tells us that they, they come up with a solution or they, they, they posit a potential solution. Well, look at verse 2. The twelve, this is the apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up the preaching of the word to serve tables. So you guys pick out from among you. Here he's going to say pick out. In verse 5 is going to tell us that they did choose. Pick out from among you seven men of good repute full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So he gives two, two um, directive statements here. He says, one, we are going to appoint them. Conversely, we're not going to run from the Scriptures, but we will, in verse 4, devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So preaching of the Word, ministry of the Word, are, are both given to us here, and this pleased the people, verse 5. So the apostles summoned the congregation, and, and if we want to put it in contemporary terms, they had a business meeting. It looks like what they did. Have you ever heard me say, please come to the business meeting, because as a member, you have rights and responsibilities when we have business meetings. Have you, don't raise your hand. But have you ever heard me say that? This is one of the reasons I say that. It's biblical to come to the business meeting. So please, come to the business meeting. We're having one coming up very soon. Then the plan given to us in verse 3 was to appoint, that the apostles would appoint after the people picked the seven. And it appears, if you look at verse 6, it looks like what happened is they, they said, you guys pick them. And, and, and they did, in verse 6, they set them before the apostles, and the appearance seems to be that the apostles vetted them, right? They said, yeah, these, this looks like a good group. Now, again, I, I realize I'm reading into it, but I'm just telling you what Luke said. They set them before them, 
And then the apostles ordained them. They, they, they laid hands on them. They uh, anointed them. Now, this resolution may very well have derived from the Old Testament. Again, I don't know that. But remember, Moses' father-in-law Jethro said to Moses, Man, you're working way too hard. Why don't you set men above groups of people here, and, and you can take care of the big issues and let them take care of the little issues. It, it may be, I mean, because we've seen that kind of thinking in the Bible before, where people looked back to the Old Testament and said, Hey, what, what did they do? And they, they followed some kind of model like that. I'm not saying they did do that. I'm saying that they may have done that. Because also, Joshua was ordained as the successor of Moses as well. So that may be where they got that concept from. Whether or not it did become the New Testament model to reach out the hand and lay upon, to identify, to determine... To ordain. That's where we get the idea. And we won't go into all of that this morning. But it looks like that's what they did. The result of this issue is found for us in verse 7. And the word of God continued. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that good? The word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. Man, it looks like it's pretty great already. You've got thousands upon thousands of people here. And it's getting bigger? That's what Luke tells us. So much so that even a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, Likely, he's telling us that some of the religious leaders for the Jews of that day became converted. Now, you have to understand, as you read through the Gospels, you, you know, you may see a handful of Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes here and there. Um, but likely, in Jerusalem anyway, you had groups of people come through in seasons to serve. And it was, and it was thousands, some say as many as 5,000 at a time. And possibly even you had four groups of 5,000 through the year come to, to minister and serve there. If that's the case, thousands of religious leaders are being converted to Christianity. Now that's not an abstract thought because we read later on in the New Testament, especially like in Galatians, where a lot of these religious Jews of the day got saved, but they didn't understand yet about the law and how it's to be, how it's fulfilled by Christ, and you don't need to circumcise and things like that. So Paul has to write a whole book on it. Well, now it, that makes sense, doesn't it? The church, both in Jerusalem and in the areas that uh, the Hebrew people had been dispersed, the diaspora, now, through the Babylonian and uh, Assyrian captivities. Many of them stayed where they were in, in their captivity, but they had um, um, temples, synagogues, and, and they still worshipped as Jews. These people come to Christ, and it takes them a little while to understand, I don't need to circumcise everybody, I don't need to keep the law, I don't need to bomb battlements around my house. Whatever the case might be, this church is in its infancy and it's growing and it's developing. And we see part of that here. And we praise the Lord for these religious people coming to Christ as well as no doubt other people. So the scripture tells us this is in verse five, pleasing to the congregation. What they said pleased the whole congregation. The resolution moved them from division in verse 1 to unity in verse 5. The resolution was blessed by God to grow the church. Now, do you see why I said early on, you don't 
run. Running is not the biblical model. Fixing it is the biblical model. Implementing what the Bible tells us as the solution God blesses. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So we can identify with problems within the church because we've experienced them. But here we have a bit of a precedent for fixing these issues. So that is what is obvious. And there's other things that could be said about this text. But there, there, there's an ongoing teaching here that, that is embedded in Luke's presentation that may not seem like the primary uh, point. So like, the, I, it, I titled every message, and the title of this one would be Enabling Devotion to the Ministry of the Word. Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. Enabling Devotion to the Ministry of the Word. You say, well, wait a minute. That's not what the, the header in my Bible says. The header in my Bible says the seven chosen or the first deacons, right? Something like that. And that, that, that did happen. That happened. But look back at verse 2. You have this problem arising in verse 1. You have the solution given. God's blessing the solution. But verse 2 says, The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching of the word of God to serve tables. You know what's really happening here? God is providing a solution to church problems that enables the proclamation of the word to continue. Deacons make it possible for preachers to preach. That's what's happening here. It, it's not just that the seven were selected. Why were the seven selected? So again, you look at the book ends, verse 1 and verse 7. The church is growing, the church is growing. Because these guys can continue to preach. Because they're not saddled with serving of tables. And I don't mean to make it sound like that. And just hold on if you think I'm demeaning deacons in some way. Every church denomination has a, a little bit different church polity church polity is the the way that you um lead how you're organized what system of governance uh, that you have okay um and, and, and some they have cardinals bishops priests pope some have uh, pastors elders deacons you know whatever the case might be okay different uh, cultures uh, different denominations ha have a little bit different. But, but again, this is where we have to look back and say, well, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach me? That's all I want to know. Do we accept things because they are held by a majority? Some people do. Do we accept things because, well, that's what um, has been long standing? Some people do. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded... Um, in, I think, Nehemiah, when Ezra's reading from the law, and I wish I could remember the verse, and, and, and he points out that in, in the reading he sees where Israel has not kept the festival of, of booths, I think, for 700 years. 700 years! This is what they're doing here, by the way. <laughs> they're, they're keeping the festival of booths after Passover. Well, if, if that's what God told them to do, even if they hadn't done it for 700 years, is the answer, well, since we hadn't done it for the last 700, why start now? 
Or should we say, whoa, what was us? We need to start keeping the festival of booths. They did. We see it right here. That should be the way we approach things. We shouldn't do things just because they work. That's pragmatism. So let me just make a couple points about this. Number one, we see this ministerial development. There's an obvious ministry distinction between these apostles and these deacons. To put it in their terms, again, going back to verse 2, we shouldn't give up preaching. That's the word he uses here, preaching the word, to serve tables. Now, now every, every pastor, every deacon will tell you that everybody in the, in the church of God is equal. They are. We are. But that doesn't mean they don't have different roles. They do. It's not unbiblical to think that. It's not monarchical to say it. Here we have it laid out for us. So, so when, when Luke says this, he said it is not reason. This is not a compound word. It's two different words. It's not right. Not right breaks down into an absolute negative of no or not. Right is good, logical, and agreeable. So it is the opposite of good, logic, and reasonable for us to leave the preaching of the word. That's what he's saying there. Now, you see why this is the issue at hand? As opposed to those who serve. This is where we get the word deacon. So, the question becomes, are these the first deacons? Much of church, church history would say, yes, this is the, the first deacons. It doesn't say that, but that appears to be what it is, and it looks like that's what the first century church did do, was continue to follow this model up until today where we still kind of do it. Okay? But it doesn't say that. What it does say, and it gives, us to, gives this to us in a couple of different words, distribution and serve or a verb and noun form of the word we use as deacon. They were distributing, deaconing, as servants, deacons. That's what they were doing. That's what the word usage is, and that's why we say probably these were, or at least later on became, the first concept of a deacon. Later division or later information, Paul gives in 1 Timothy 3, where he actually adds more to these qualifications. Here you just see three. You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit, good repute, things like that. Later on in 1 Timothy 3, Paul will give more detail to these qualifications of the deacons. But, but you have to understand that the New Testament church is not monarchical. Because there's a second element here. And this is something we believe. And we practice. Lord willing, I just, you know, I just gave you an invitation to help us practice it very soon in the church business meeting. And that is what we refer to now as congregational government. So when we have deacons or we have other decisions that need to be made, we go to the congregation. What think ye? <laughs> And we take votes. So you have congregational government. That's exactly what happened here. They gathered everybody together. They laid out the problem. Here's a potential solution. The people agreed with it. Verse 5 says, and they were pleased that the, the whole gathering was pleased. They selected these different men. And then the apostles okayed them and ordained them. But it was with congregational government. Another thing to notice about this, and when you look at these seven men, every one of them have Greek names. Every one. Now, what that tells us is if we have this division between Hebrews or Hebrew-speaking Jews and Greek-speaking Jews, 
And, and the, the people that the whole congregation selected were all Greek speakers. You know what that says? That appeases the Greek speaking people who are being neglected. We are, we are willing to let the Greeks be the ones who do the serving for everybody. Because we're sensitive to the issue of neglect that the Grecian people are experiencing. That was a very humbling way to go about it. How wise was that? And every one of these guys we expect was probably Grecian, except for Nicholas, who, though he had a Greek name, was a proselyte of Antioch. So he may have been just a, you know, cur gentile kind of guy. We don't know. And if you're thinking that this is uh, the predecessor of the Nicolaitans in the book of the Revelation, maybe, but we don't know that. So, so don't ascribe to him that heretical label because we don't know that he deserves it. So, so don't do that to him. But, but, but maybe, okay? So all these people had Greek names. They had met the qualifications given to them uh, here by the apostles. And, and the people were pleased with their selection. Now, does this mean then that deacons can't preach? No. In fact, we know it doesn't mean that because we're going to see Philip preach in Acts chapter 8 and we're going to see Stephen preach in Acts chapter 7. So the reality is deacons can preach, but that doesn't make them an apostle. Pastors, elders, even apostles back in the day could serve tables. That didn't make them necessarily a deacon. It just means they did the work of a deacon. How many times have you ever seen your pastor out on church work day? Was he too good to go out on church work day? Of course he isn't. He shouldn't think that he is. He's going out doing the work of a, a worker. He's serving his church. He's ministering to his people with a shovel in hand. As opposed to being behind the desk. Sermon writing. I love to get away from my desk. If, if you know anything about me, you stop in here just about any time, and I will be happy to get outside with you and do whatever you want to do. You can't say I don't because I do. I love it. And you know, there's people that are going to stand here and preach instead of me or Joel. But that doesn't alter the office. It doesn't secondly mean that we can't have deaconesses. But deaconesses, which we have here at Hunters Creek, are not officers. We see nowhere in the New Testament that tells us, or gives qualifications for deaconesses as an office. But we see deaconesses. We have deaconesses. We have ladies who do work. They minister to the people of the church in a variety of ways. And then thirdly, we saw here the apostles. Now... I know this is almost like a history lesson. Please forgive me, but there's just a lot here. A, an apostle, by definition, was somebody who had seen Jesus. Right? So you say, well, Paul wasn't an apostle. Actually, he was, because on the Damascus Road, who did he see? Jesus. Right? All these men had seen Jesus. Now, reflect back. Remember when we were in, back in Acts chapter 2 and Peter coming off after the ascension, the disciples get together in the upper room and they're, they're saying, hey, we got to pick, pick somebody to take Judas's place. And they said, and that's why I emphasized this back then because I knew this was coming. They said, we've got to get somebody who's been with us since the baptism of John. Every one of those people had been with the apostles the whole length of not the whole length of Jesus' ministry, but once he started pulling in apostles. And they wanted somebody from that point. And they took somebody from that point because they had all seen Jesus. That was one of the qualifications. Now, we don't have apostles. At least I don't believe we have apostles anymore because of that one um, criteria. Some people believe that we do. I don't. 
But what's happened is because we don't, just like these people eventually became what we think of as a deacon, the apostles transferred or translated, if you will, into the later on the preachers, the elders of the local New Testament church, the leaders, the teachers. So here, just like you see in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, here in this text, you see the same dichotomy. We teach and preach the word, and the deacons serve the tables. That's the exact same dichotomy that you have when you get into 1 Timothy 3 and the breakdown between that chapter. So it, it only makes sense to lay it out this way. If there's a better way, I don't know it. Okay? That seems to be what they did. That seems to be, for the most part, the way the local New Testament church has done this. So then they ordained these, these deacons. Secondly, or thirdly, all these deacons were men. Now, again, remember when we were back in Acts chapter 2, and I emphasized this because I knew this was coming, that they picked men. This is not sexism. This isn't misogyny. This isn't any of that. This is, the God, this is God's model. This is what he did. And so they picked men then, and they picked men here because the offices of the local New Testament church or males, for, for whatever reason, I think there's good reasons, that God did that. But he d is the one who did it. So again, this doesn't preclude deaconesses. This isn't misogynistic. It's the biblical model. And that's why I would say, w when we have here building for us a developing bibliology, a model, a teaching, a systematic theology in this area. And we're going to continue to see it. You're, you're going to hear me talk about Acts 2 and Acts 6 when we get into uh, Acts 14, Acts 20, uh, and things like that, because it continues to build. And theologians call that a bibliology or a developing a systematic theology. We'll connect those dots then. Now, I hope this has been helpful for us. With this type of presentation and with this type of text, it is easy for some to think that either the preacher or the Bible is making less of the deaconate. I assure you, that's not the case. And I'll prove it to you right now. And I love the way the King James says it again. That those who fulfill the office of the, of the deacon gain to themselves a good degree. The ESV doesn't use that, that terminology. A good degree. And a degree is not, you know, a master's or a bachelor's. or It's not academic. It, it, it's a measurement. It, it's like to move up. I'm going to step it up a degree. Do, do you know what Paul's saying about the deacons in 1 Timothy 3? They're a step above. He is highlighting them. He is glorifying them. That's what God does for his servants. In fact, although we're told to obey those that are over us in the Lord... We never hear pastors, like I can think of, we never hear pastors talked of as being, you know, some kind of special degree. But we do about deacons. That's wonderful. How many of you out there have somebody that you can look back to in your past, or maybe presently, and say, that dude is golden. That has got to be the best deacon I've ever seen. He is wonderful as always. In fact, I'm not going to mention their name, but maybe the best deacon I know of ever is in this congregation. He's in here right now. I'm not going to point him, out, point him out. He'll kill me. He'll put me down a degree. But he might be the best I know. Now, 
This is, just seems to be what the Bible teaches us. So in conclusion, the Word of God really is powerful. And the world and its spiritual forces will always try to get us to get away from the Bible, the biblical model, the biblical teaching, whether it's salvation or church polity or whatever. Because Satan knows that God is a God of order and he wants to destroy it. And the church is the pillar and ground of the truth and Satan wants to destroy it too. He can't, but he's going to endeavor to. It's up to us to do our part to defend it. Both of these things are really important for us. People can be distracted from the preaching because of problems. And people can distract the preacher with their problems. Now, I love your problems. I want your problems. Me personally. Every pastor may not say that. But Luke makes it very, very clear that it is not right to give up the preaching of the word and the preacher's devotion to the ministry and prayer and the, and the preaching of the word is paramount. It is paramount. You've heard us say that before. And here, this text seems to lay that out for us. So then lastly, how can I worship God in relation to this text? Well, you can. Number one, because God provides solutions to our problems. Two, because God blesses his solutions to our shortcomings, our failures. Thirdly, because God gives servants to his church and he honors those servants. I, I, am, I am so tempted, I won't do it, but I am so tempted to ask every one of our deacons to stand. In fact, you know what I am going to do? So, and here's why. Because I want you to know who they are. Because everybody doesn't know who they are. So I'm going to ask if you are a deacon or have ever been a deacon here at Hunters Creek Community Church, please stand. I know you don't want to, begging for your forgiveness, but please do. If you are or ever have been, I know there's more than that. There's a couple of you not standing up. Amen. The, these, these guys are a step above. They're a step above, and we should honor them as such. Amen? And there's a couple of them back there in the back, too. Thank you, gentlemen. Although the people of the church are not perfect, the God and Savior of the church is perfect. That's why he was the Savior. So if you're looking for the perfect church, keep looking because we're not it. If you're looking for the perfect Savior, well, we got a lot we can tell you about him because we know him. He is our God. Amen.